Our first speaker is Rachel Watton. So Rachel has been a migrant sex worker for over 15 years, working both in Australia and overseas. Rachel's previous roles as international spokesperson for Scarlet Alliance and outreach officer at the Sex Workers Outreach Project in New South Wales have given her the opportunity to present, to present sex worker issues at many conferences around the world while networking with sex workers from around the globe. Rachel is also a founding member of Touching Base, which brings people with disability and sex workers together to advocate, advocate for the rights of both communities and to decrease the stigma and discrimination faced by both people with disabilities and sex workers. Rachel is currently juggling being a sex worker, presenting at conferences and workshops, and doing postgraduate research at the University of Sydney. Welcome, Rachel. Welcome, everyone. I'm very pleased to be the first presenter. So I'm going to go over briefly about what is the Swedish model and then progress through as to how it affects sex workers, um, what's been happening there and what the essential problems are with the, with the Swedish model. So essentially the Swedish model refers to the Swedish government's current laws regulating prostitution. From January 1st, 1999, it became illegal to buy or to try to buy sexual services in Sweden. The law criminalises the client who purchases the sexual services as <coughs> not a sex worker. And the relevant part of the law states, the person who for payment obtains a casual <coughs> sexual relationship is penalised unless the action entails punishment in accordance with the penal code for the purchase of sexual services with fines or imprisonment for a maximum of six months. The law criminalises situations where money, drugs, gifts, even luxurious <coughs> dinners have been mentioned or other forms of compensation have been agreed upon, even if not actually given, in exchange for sexual services. And the law does not actually define what casual means within this. And that proves problems automatically, as a lot of, a lot of clients and sex workers have formed working relationships over many years, and clients have become regulars for years and even decades with sex workers. <coughs> sexual relations has been defined as sexual intercourse, but actually when breaking down to its base level, it's been defined as touching another person's genitals. So therefore in Sweden, erotic dancing and stripping, posing nude or even masturbating in front of someone for payment, is not included within this law. So what the, <coughs> what the laws are actually included, what other laws, and how the Swedish model actually affects sex work. While the Swedish model is a general term referring to the criminalisation of clients of sex workers, there are in fact other laws introduced that restrict how sex workers can operate in Sweden. While providing sexual services is perfectly legal, absolutely everything around a sex worker's business activities has become illegal. <coughs> That's not generally known. The laws specifically focus on outlawing third-party management, as you can see there, and commonly known as being charged with pimping or living off the earnings, and also criminalising anyone who assists in the commission of a crime. Therefore, these laws can be used against landlords, hotel <coughs> management, newspapers and online websites based in Sweden, flatmates, partners and children who live with sex workers, and anyone who may drive a sex worker to a client. Examples of how this can negatively affect sex workers includes sex workers will be evicted from their home if the landlord finds out that they are working from there. Sex workers who work from a shared premises in a cooperative environment may be charged with exploiting each other's sexual labour. Hotels can refuse to rent a room to someone if they suspect they may be a sex worker. And with the advent of Google searches, if you're involved in sex worker activism with your real name, and then you're actually buy, uh, trying to rent a hotel room under your real name, people have not been allowed to do that in Sweden. Unlike any other occupation, sex workers cannot ad uh, advertise within Sweden, and they have to rely on websites hosted in other countries. And sex workers who live with family members, friends, and others in shared accommodation risk the fact that everyone around them, everyone who's living in that house, can also be charged with this first law. This places the sex worker in a complete social and economic void. The laws punish them for working in an occupation that, while deemed legal, has categorised them as a helpless victim instead of a self-determining agent. So what were the intentions of the Swedish, mo Swedish model? The official government position in Sweden is that the purchase of sex constitutes violence by men against women. 
This is illustrated by a Swedish government's committee statement in 95 that no prostitution can be said to be of a voluntary nature. In 98, the Swedish Parliament passed a law reform measure entitled the Protection of Women, which is where these sex worker laws are housed. So while the intentions of these Protection of Women laws were solely really focused on domestic violence and assault, they conflated their aims and blurred their vision by including an occupation when talking predominantly about domestic violence. And domestic violence defined in Sweden is that committed by a man who has a close relationship to the woman concerned. Another quote from the Swedish government, a, a policy paper, is prostitution is not a desirable social phenomenon. The government considers, however, that it is not reasonable to punish the person who sells a sexual service. In the majority of cases, at least, this person is a weaker partner who is exploited by those who want to only satisfy their sexual drive. It is also important to motivate prostitutes to seek help to lead their way of life. They should not run the risk of punishment because they've been acting as prostitutes. The public opinion within uh, Sweden has changed. While it started off um, not very, support, uh, very supportive of these really horrific laws, because sex workers have been speaking up and they're finally getting their own voice, and this is through the, the arrangement of Rose Alliance, which is the sex worker organisation in Sweden, and also many sex worker blogs. Um, they've been able to have a voice. And in fact, one blog written by Isabella Lund has been extremely well known. And in fact, high level government officials have been um, admitting that they were regular readers and actually gaining a lot of information about the sex industry that was never given to them via these blogs. Why the Swedish model fails? There's quite a number of them, of course, and we could be here all day. But I'm going to briefly go through them. So there's no aware awareness, first of all, as we know, of the diversity of the industry, the scale of operation, and that men, women and trans people work in the industry as sex workers and are clients. It doesn't recognise sex workers' work. One sex worker has written on her blog, is it harmful to have sex with strangers? Is it harmful to make money? No, to sell your time, your company, your sexual services is not in itself harmful but it is damaging to sex workers to be subjected to oppressive conditions like discrimination and social stigma. Swedish prostitution law contributes to such oppression. Sex workers are being discriminated against and thus prejudice and stereotypes are preserved. There are increased levels of corruption. Anyone can dob in a sex worker and, this can in, at this, to, and to the police. This can include an ex-partner, a neighbour, someone going for the same job. As we know, we always have, we often have more than one job. So if I'm um, being interviewed for a job and someone else knows that I'm also a sex worker, they can go and dob me in. And because of the levels of stigma and discrimination in this country, it means that I may not get that job. So the thing that I want to point out to you then, as you can read the other things there, there's two points. Conflating the role of the police. They're supposed to be the protectors of the community. We're supposed to be able to go to them when there's a crime committed against us. If they are the regulators of the sex industry in any manner, then they are also seen as the enforcers. And that is completely unacceptable for, for anyone's human rights. The other thing that I'd like to say is that there's a lot of statistics that's been bandied around about um, since uh, the Swedish model has been introduced, there's been less sex workers, there's been this, there's been that. The reality is, the things that um, all the sex workers in Sweden say is that there was no research done before it was introduced. So there was never a baseline figure in, at the start. The reality is, is that sex worker voices in Sweden were not heard. They were not on any panel, they were not in any discussions at a government level, and that is completely abhorrent on anything. And in terms of um, doing research now and trying to find figures, when you start reading different things, even the government officials can't agree on things. There's two quotes that um, you can go back to later from Ben Kai Moon, Secretary General of the United Nations there. And then the other one that people should be aware of in terms of the UN guidance known like HIV and sex work. I'd like to acknowledge Peter Jacobson from Rose Alliance for her enormous contributions not only to everything that I learn and present here, but in terms of the, the, the fight for um, sex worker rights in Sweden and around the world. And then I strongly advise everyone, because sex workers should always have a voice on every level to do with our occupation, is to go to the YouTube um, where Peter Jacobson, a Swedish sex worker who's spoken around the world, speaks 
and talks predominantly about what the problems and the issues are. And it should always come from the six minutes voice. Thank you.